Most of us can expect to live 28,502 days. We'll spend 1,374 of those days reading books. We'll spend another 1,259 days online. And we'll spend 8,250 precious days holding our children. 1,000 days. That's roughly how long you'll live once you're diagnosed with ALS. Hi, my name's Pete. I was diagnosed on March 13, 2012. My husband, George, was officially diagnosed with ALS in the summer of 2003. My father was also named Tom Kane. He got diagnosed with ALS in 2002, passed away two years later, June 27th of uh, 2004. ALS is one of these diseases that for many people has a very insidious onset. I think it was the, the physical appearance was the most telling, first and foremost. You know, people can lose weight and still look healthy. There was something about his look that just didn't look healthy. Started feeling some twitching up in uh, my upper arms. Okay, I'll drink an extra Gatorade, eat an extra banana, and I'll be okay. Our daughter was born in July of 2002. When she was about three months old, uh, my first really distinct memory of a symptom was coming home one evening and George told me he was changing her diaper and he told me he was having difficulty pulling the taps in her diaper. And we laugh about it now because, of course, my reaction, which was get back in there and change that diaper, it turned out that it was actually one of the opening salvos of a very serious problem. He had an appointment with the doctor and, and that's when uh, they told him. And he called me, you know, when he got home and, and, and told us what it was. George came home and said he thinks it could be ALS, and we just thought he needed to see somebody who knew what they were talking about. A, B, C, D, E, disbelief. Mm. And then he delivered the diagnosis of ALS. My life hasn't, hasn't been the same since that, that moment. It's not to be a 54-year-old guy watching his athletically gifted and graceful son wither away. That's not the way this is supposed to work. It was very tough on my parents that day, but for myself, I kind of just nodded my head and said, yep, okay, that's what we're dealing with, so let's strap it on and, and um, see how we can attack this thing. The best advice he gave was for George to go home and continue living his life. You have an illness, you're gonna to have to live with that illness until you're no longer living with that illness, but live. George took his advice um, to the fullest. P Q R S F G. It was torture at first. It was small things like not being able to put on a binder clip or button my shirt. But when I could no longer lift my arms or walk, the harsh reality that I was going to be a quadriplegic for the rest of my life set in. What I thought I knew was that this was an old person's disease. What I know now is that it affects a lot of young people, everyone, every lifestyle. And I guess I've been really um, taken back by how many healthy, athletic people this disease has attacks. George was uh, a phenomenal athlete his entire life. He was a standout athlete in high school and college, and he played professionally overseas for a while, um, continued playing. Anybody who would give him a basketball, he would be involved in the sport. Here's the number nine hitter in the order now, Peter Frades. Big, strong left-hander who hit home runs all over the college uh, campuses of the Big East, uh, ACC. And that is hit high and deep. That's a grand slam home run for Peter Freddy's. 
He even hit one at Fenway Park. And for a left-hander in a college baseball game, to hit it out of Fenway Park over 400 feet, uh, uh, that's quite an accomplishment. So to see that left hand, which once had the power and grace uh, to play athletics at the top, and now not really be able to do much of anything. To feel this loss of control, this helplessness, this is what I think just sucks. My dad was, uh, you know, full of energy, full of life, uh, full of fun, little guy. Always had the big greeting, would like to joke around, kid around. This was a guy when he was younger, starting married life. He was in the Knights of Columbus and dressing up as, you know, Mae West and singing. He liked the spotlight, and he continued to do that even after he got diagnosed to some degree. You know, at the same time, though, he was a, a caretaker. My mother was diagnosed with multiple sclerosis, probably 90 or 91. It was harder for my father because he was the he was the caregiver that gets lost a lot of times with these diseases you know the the toll on the caregivers and then you throw his diagnosis on top of that it was uh, just created a you know a havoc for my dad his his main concern was always his wife you know like making sure she got taken care of you know, yeah it was quite a couple of years. <laughs> I think this disease has um, brought out the best in my son in some ways. He's always been an inspiration. And how he is handling this diagnosis makes me as proud a mother as I've ever been. It's kind of like the new normal, and I'm getting comfortable with it, and, you know, kind of looking forward to, you know, a lot of these things that I've wanted to do and creating awareness for ALS is, you know, kind of my main focus. It's 2012, it's not 1939 when Lou Gehrig made his final speech there at Yankee Stadium. Uh, there's a lot of people out there doing a lot of great things. Hopefully they know me well enough to know that I'm not going to take this thing lying down. A lot of people don't know that much about ALS because it's, it is a, considered an orphan disease. There isn't a, a, a great deal of the population at any time that is living with it because typically people are dying from it. Unfortunately these days it's about numbers. It doesn't get the attention that some of the other causes do. Eleni and I, whenever we see a wishing well, we always dig into my purse and we get a few coins and we throw them in. And when Eleni blows out her birthday candles, she always makes her wish. And Eleni and I look at each other and we've always made the same wish. Our biggest hope is that uh, an effective treatment for ALS will be found. Our dream is that a cure will be found for this disease. And our goal, I think, is that we can be part of that. And, you know, that's why we're involved in Prize for Life. The, uh, the identification of a biomarker is just such a, a huge step in the progression to fighting this that we have momentum now. And now's the time to really uh, take that momentum and build on it and, um, and, and end this thing. A thousand days aren't enough. With your help, the dream of a treatment can become a reality and give ALS patients more time. My dreams and plans are kind of uncertain right now in terms of how long I have to execute those plans or how I will be able to go about doing that. There's a lot of open-ended questions here. Let's find some answers. We're hoping, you know, real, real soon somebody really smart out there is going to figure something out to be able to slow this thing down exponentially or, most importantly, reversal for a cure. Down deep in my soul, I really do believe that it's coming. Finding a treatment for ALS would mean everything.